I know we complain that 2020 cannot be over soon enough, but look on the bright side. 5780 ends tonight. And it has been a most difficult year. And while gathering like this virtually remotely is a reminder that the difficulty is still with us, we can take comfort and draw strength from the fact that we are still all together. And as I turn to share with you some thoughts this evening, this year I am torn. I know we need to confront the horrors of our world head on. I want to acknowledge your fears and anxieties, and I share them with you. I want to provide some comfort. And if you've been around me long enough, you know that I like to enter our high holiday season on a bit of a lighter note, drawing on events of my past year to present you on Erev Rosh Hashanah with a list of things I've learned or come to understand based on these events. And while perhaps these two impulses are not so far off, so much has happened this past year, and it's hard to disassociate the events in our greater world from what happened to me this past year. And by sharing a list, what you have come to expect and what is indeed traditional for our celebration of the new year, I hope to provide some comfort. It seems like just yesterday and forever ago that our world shut down. It was right after Purim, the last gathering we held at TBH, that we retreated to our homes in the face of the coronavirus. We had to adapt to new realities of work and school, and in our case, spiritual community. And because certain activities to which we were accustomed were closed off to us, we discovered new ways to spend our time. And so, as we gather at this new year, I present to you the six things I've learned about life and teshuva from what I did during quarantine. First, I baked. Yes, it's a quarantine cliche. We all started baking. Flour and yeast were hard to come by in the stores. And while I did make my share of banana breads and I never did get on the sourdough train, I spent a lot of time doing what I called Jewish nostalgia baking, making foods I loved and missed from my upbringing in New York, both from the bakeries around us and from the kitchen of my mother and grandmother. In addition to making challah for the first time in my life, I researched and learned how to make black and white cookies, almond cookies with a chocolate drop, kichel, which I always called bow ties, Kaiser rolls and bagels that I remember from the delis and bakeries we would frequent. And after securing the recipes, I made my mother's rugelach, the oily apple cake that was my grandfather's favorite on Rosh Hashanah, and pletzlach, the onion bread that would be an all-day affair to make which when received would be such a special treat. Of course, there was the eating aspect of baking, as well as the focus on home skills at a time when we're spending more time at home. But there was another meaningful aspect to this for me. I did call it nostalgia baking, for there was that aspect of looking back at things I enjoyed from my past. But for me, this baking was also about the future. There was something about the quarantine time, the being isolated from others and the fear of the pandemic that inspired a need to think about our personal traditions. Because it was those that would ground us. It was those that would provide comfort in the known when there was so much unknown. And there was something that reminded me that I am the next link in a chain and that I needed to claim certain things for myself. I needed to know for myself that I could make these recipes and claim them, and in doing so, I would then be able to pass them down. I wouldn't need to rely on others to do it for me. We are living in a time when institutions are being challenged, when the norms and routines of our lives are being upended. This is a time then to reclaim and to hold on to things that help define who we are. Not necessarily so we can just look backwards, so that we can provide a continuity with the future. What traditions do you keep? What is important for you to pass on? What chain of our tradition are you taking responsibility for? And as we confront loss and disruption, how will you find continuity? 
thinking forward and looking backward. The second thing I did during quarantine was genealogy. <clears throat> a few years ago when TBH was celebrating its 75th anniversary, we sponsored a program with the Washington State Jewish Genealogical Society on researching your roots. I got excited, I set up an account on Ancestry.com and I jumped in building my family tree. And then a few weeks later, I put it aside. Until this year when during the pandemic, I picked up the genealogy bug again and did a deep dive into researching my family. Sifting through documents, conducting searches, pouring through lists, I was able to piece together branches of my family I did not know about. And I ended up connecting with distant cousins to share information and from whom I received this picture of my grandmother, my great-grandparents, her parents, and my great-great-grandparents, her grandparents. My goal was to at least find out the cities from which my great-grandparents came. My, all my grandparents were born here in the U.S. To find out the year of their crossing and the vessel that brought them to these shores. I wasn't 100% successful with each set of great-grandparents thus far, but I did find a lot of answers, some moving documents. I learned some interesting stories, and the searching continues. Our past stories don't wholly define us but they are what brought us to this place in this moment. Our stories carry hope and promise, trauma and pain. We don't live in the past, but we need to ask ourselves, how do our own pasts and narratives inspire who we are and what we do? And narrative is playing a big role in our society today. The growing power of Black Lives Matter and the movement for racial justice has challenged us to think about the narratives that we tell in this country about its founding, its history, and its progress. Asking questions about privilege that bring us to reevaluate and reexamine what we know and assume. And even for our own stories, I think now of my own immigrant ancestors and how they were privileged in that they came to this country freely on the deck of a boat, rather than in chains below it. And once we have a better picture of the past, we have a better foundation upon which to write our future. On the high holidays, we begin to write the next chapter of our lives. And like any good story, it involves not only creativity and imagination, but research and reflection. What stories will you write and rewrite in the year to come? Staying and working from home led to the third thing I did during quarantine, and that is playing guitar. Now, granted, this one may be a bit of a cheat because, as you know, I started taking guitar lessons about a year before we entered the pandemic, a fulfillment of a desire I had for the past 20 years to learn an instrument, or perhaps even longer, nursing that regret I felt after quitting the clarinet in elementary school after only six months. But I particularly wanted to learn guitar to bring new spirit and music to our services and to our programs. And while I hadn't been taking lessons before quarantine, this time has provided a new opportunity to lean into the instrument. And not only because more time at home should translate into more practice time, which, which it did more or less, but because I found that when I played the guitar for leading services, I was less self-conscious playing in front of a screen as opposed to in front of a room full of people. Without that pressure of a real-time response that I could see, right, it's harder to read responses on Zoom and just non-existent when we're live streaming, it allowed me to take more risks. And this coupled with the encouragement from my teacher who counseled me to just go for it even if I hadn't already perfected a song because that was ultimately the way to grow and to learn by just jumping in and doing it. And here too is a lesson in humility. Not only the humility that must come from taking on a new skill as an adult, something that requires a whole new way of thinking and doing, and not just the humility of being guided by someone who is an expert for whom this comes so naturally as I stumble over chord changes and strum patterns, but the humility of leading while learning, of being able to stumble and recover, of being able to be present while also being incomplete. 
when I play the guitar during our remote Shabbat services, I know I'm not hitting every chord. I know I run out of breath while singing something I'm working on. And yet, during this time of quarantine, being in front of the screen has allowed me to take those risks and something that I know that will carry over into when we return to being in person. We acknowledge on this day that we are not defined by our past mistakes, that we are always trying and falling short, and we're always seeking the right conditions to take risks and to then learn from them. We must just jump right in, even if it's not perfect. During the quarantine, our house got a little more full as school moved to online learning for our younger son, and our older son came home from college. But it got a little more full as, for our number four, we added a kitten to our family. At some point, it seemed that kittens became a pandemic trend as well, for post after post on my Facebook feed were filled with people showing off their new cats. And we got on that bandwagon as well when we came home one day to discover that Ozzy had rescued a kitten from a litter that was dropped off at the farm where he's working this summer. And while we have a bunch of animals at home, it has been quite a while since we had a kitten. Trout fit in quite well with our family, gets along mostly well with the other cats and dogs, and brings a whole new energy into our house with bursts of activity, climbing on everything, and ferocious attacks on legs and feet. Why did kittens become a pandemic thing for some? I know for us, it was having an opportunity for having new life in our house and something that we could unconditionally love. Pets are always exercises in compassion, bringing another living thing into your home that is dependent on your care, your providing basic needs, your offering of shelter and companionship. All of which is so needed at this time. At a time of illness and loss, it felt especially meaningful to celebrate life, to find opportunities to be a nurturer, to care for something or someone who is dependent on you. The pandemic and time in quarantine has reminded us in so many ways that we are responsible for one another. And we can look upon that responsibility as a source of joy, not a burden. By willingly bringing a new pet into our homes during this time, we affirm that a basic part of human nature is to care for others, and especially those who are dependent on you. Introducing a, a new kitten into our family was not the only change in our house, as the fifth thing I did during quarantine was paint our bathroom. We've lived in the same house the entire time we've lived in Olympia, almost 18 years now. Our house when we moved in is a combination of an older property and a new construction. And for those who've been around a while, you'll remember that one of the first one of these types of sermons was describing what I learned when a backhoe had hit that house. But in the newer part of our house, that when we moved in, the walls were not painted. And so we set about almost immediately to adding color to the bedrooms, the living rooms, and even the finished basement but we never got around to painting the bathroom. For years, we were fine with the white primer coat. It never seemed to matter. Then a few weeks ago, after swapping out some light bulbs, it struck us how plain this space was. So one Sunday, I prepped the space, bought the supplies, and painted the bathroom. And now it feels like a completely new space, more like our home. Perhaps it makes sense that during this time of Spending more time at home, we turn our energy to those things in our homes that require our attention. The parts of our physical space that we can fix, improve, and spiff up. We definitely brainstorm more projects than we have the capacity for at this time. But painting the bathroom had the impact it did because, for me, it was one of those things that you just put off because of all the work you anticipate putting into it, only to realize that when you do it, it wasn't that much work and you could have done it much sooner. We all have these in our lives. And for me, it took the pandemic to learn that what we spend so much time and energy avoiding could turn out to not be a big deal. 
There's also a Jewish teaching that when you build a house, you should leave a corner of one's house unfinished in remembrance of the destruction of the ancient temple and as a sign that the world can continually be perfected. Well, I could claim that I left the bathroom unpainted for so long in honor of this tradition. I'll just say that sometimes our piece of perfecting the world takes a while to complete. And every time we make a repair or an improvement is the right time. And of course, there's always more to do. We are constantly engaged in the work of repair. And following on the painting project, the sixth meaningful thing I did during quarantine was to buy new shelves for our refrigerator. It may not seem like much, but it was a bit of a project. It did lead me to what I might call the dark web of wholesale replacement parts. I had found a supplier down in Texas, and after lining up the exact model of the fridge, we were able to buy new shelves to replace ones that had cracked and broken over time. In total, it was two brackets, one shelf, and both crisper drawers on the bottom that needed replacement. The shelf had still worked, but the fact that we had no crisper drawers meant we were piling produce on the bottom of the fridge. And since we were missing two of the three door brackets, we had just stored everything in the main compartment. Little by little, they had broken over time, not all at once. And then when that big box from Texas arrived, our fridge was reborn. And looking back, this was, this was perhaps the easiest, the simplest, the quickest thing that I did during quarantine. But replacing those parts provided perhaps the most profound lesson for me. Because looking back over time, as each draw broke, as each bracket cracked, we just adapted. We moved things around, we crammed things together, we stacked things on top of each other. And then when we put in those new draws and brackets, everything was renewed, everything was in their place. Things were easier to find. The fridge was more organized. And in some ways it was only after making those fixes that I even realized how awkward and hard it was to live like that. It was only after making the repair did we realize how broken things had been. And yet, that is, honestly, how we are most of the time. When things are broken, the easiest thing we do is just adapt to the brokenness. Especially if things break slowly over time, we just slowly adapt into a new reality, sometimes without even knowing it. But if Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur teach us anything, it's that life does not need to be this way. Life should not be this way. We do not just need to adapt to the brokenness, to live with the way things are. We can create our reality. We can and we must fix what's broken. We can live into the way things should be. It is hard work. It may not be as simple as ordering parts from an online catalog, but it is the important work that we are called upon to do during these holy days. Of course, these were not the only six things I did during quarantine. With our family home, more often we had more family dinners, including Shabbat dinners, in the past few months than we had in 18 years. When things began to open up somewhat, I took up fishing something I'd wanted to do for a long time. I binge watch TV shows, I joined TikTok, and I have to admit there are a few projects that I started and didn't complete, like putting in a garden, even though we did manage to level out a slope on our yard and build a retaining wall. And of course, throughout this time, I continued to work and serve our Jewish community in new ways. The quarantine is and has been a unique period in our lifetimes, and we know it's not over yet. The intensity of March may have led to the loosening of September, but we know that we will be under some form of quarantine for some time. And certain things like meeting together in our synagogue may not happen for a while. 
it has been a time of anxiety and it has been a time of adaptation. And for me, I've tried to use it as a time for self-care and self-discovery. During this time, I have laid claims to the traditions that are mine to pass down. I've confronted the past so with the future. I've taken risks and persevered through my missteps. I've affirmed our human capacity for compassion and care. I brought about repair and improvement to our world. And I vowed not to adapt to brokenness, but to create the world that I want. These are things that will persist long after the quarantine is over. And these are things that are not just for me to affirm, but for all of us to affirm. And for all of the things that we did do during this time, perhaps the most precious, the most holy, is what we didn't do during quarantine. We didn't go out. We didn't draw physically close to people. We didn't reveal our faces. And by doing this, or not doing this, we recognized and honored the divine spark in each and every one of us. We declared, I am not more important than another. We affirmed that each one of us is worthy. For indeed, we are. Let us continue to live into that spirit, into whatever this next year brings us. Shana Tovah.